Good morning and welcome to everyone. Dear sisters, brothers, and non-binary kin, namaste, satsriyaka, jai janindra, and namo buddhaya. It's an honor to welcome you th to this morning's program entitled Dalit Human Rights, Interconnected Narratives of Activism and Spirituality. This conversation with renowned activist Srimati Jyotiraji is kindly being hosted by the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs and is co-sponsored by Georgetown University Dharmic Life, the GU Hindu Students Association, Georgetown Sikh Student Association, Georgetown's Buddhist Student Association, Georgetown University's Women's Center, Princeton University's Hindu Life Program, Yale University's Hindu Life Program, Tufts Hindu Chaplaincy, New York University's Hindu Center, and Emory University's Hindu Chaplaincy. I'm deeply grateful to everyone involved in setting up this event, especially to Rameshji and Prashantiji for making the connections with us to our esteemed speakers. Like the term Dalit itself, issues facing peoples formerly grouped together as untouchables under the laws of the Raj and other empires and by Mimansaka Vedic societies preceding them, the issues have been used by domestic and international political and religious groups of all varieties for their own agendas. The voices of these peoples have continued to be directed and channeled by elitist peoples who exercise their privilege, presenting themselves as if they are the liberators of Dalits. The work of Jyoti Raji inspires me. Here we have an erudite, dedicated activist and educator of the community of interest who dares to challenge the dominant narrative, declaring we are Adijans, first peoples. Her ethos is that through using the innate spirituality, resilience and wisdom of their own millennia old cultures and oral traditions to overcome the mountainous adversities faced in Indian societies, Dalit or rather Adijan people can find the strength and inspiration needed to liberate themselves. This call to innate holistic empowerment has resonated with numerous people across the subcontinent where Jyoti Raji and her team at Bhushakti Kendra work. An example of the wisdom of the Adijans is glimpsed through the work of our second guest, Pritam Kasimir Raj. A celebrated artist, he works with Jyoti Raji on projects implementing natural farming methods in accordance with the practice developed over thousands of years by the peoples who know the land best. I'm so grateful that they are joining us today from the village of Tumkur in Karnataka, India, where it is evening time. And it is truly our deepest honor to listen to their voices today. I would like to also introduce the facilitator for this unique conversation. Professor Shireen Joshi is an internationally recognized economist who has worked on poverty alleviation for underprivileged rural women's groups in India, pollution and childhood health, and has consulted for the World Bank, the United Nations, and numerous nonprofits. And before I hand over to her, I would like to remind everyone that this conversation will be recorded. And for those who have registered, you will receive this recording by email. Importantly, should you have questions that we, you would like uh, us to submit to our speakers, please use the question and answer functions on your screens. Accepting our invitation to assist in maintaining an inclusive and respectful place while doing so. Thank you very much for joining us. And I hand over now to Professor Joshi. Thank you so much, Brahmachari Ji. And thank you so much to our guests um, for being here today. And thank you for the, to the Berkeley Center for hosting. Um, I'd love to begin our conversation building off of what you said, Brahmachari Ji, about this concept of holistic empowerment. So um, I guess I would ask you, um, Jyoti Raji and Pritam Ji, to speak a little more um, about the starting point for this holistic empowerment, maybe by talking about the term Adijan itself. What do you mean by the term? And can you contrast it with other terms that are employed to describe um, the communities that you are advocating for? Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to be with all of you. And a special thanks to uh, Sharanji, Professor, and definitely uh, Rameshji and Prashanti who introduced us to 
all of you. And I think we have very short time and within that time we have to really um, reach the maximum understanding of uh, things which are raised here. Uh, all of us know that uh, Adi, the word Adi is uh, uh, the South Indian language. Adi means the original. So when we say Adi Jan, it is the original people of India we are talking about. So today, the identity question comes in contrast to uh, the ascriptions we have received in the history. Uh, I need to talk to you about uh, the different ascriptions we have gone through in the historical context. If you take mythology uh, or mythical context, the, the original people of India, they were known as uh, Asuras. Um, actually, the meaning of Asura is people who did not believe in the gods in the heavens. That's it. Then uh, there is another ascription called Rakshasas. Um, I, I think uh, yeah. devil, demons but actually they were rakshakas in the sense they were protectors of forests and other resources of this country. Then uh, there is another ascription called Chandala. Um, those who are studying Hindu scriptures, you will know there is the story uh, of Trishanku. Uh, if you read that story, the meaning of Chandala comes in there. He was cursed as Chandala, um, ugly, and uh, untouchable, and you know, all that ascriptions are there. Then later, when the caste system was organized as a social system, we have other set of ascriptions. Uh, for example, uh, we are known as uh, Shudras, Ati Shudras, and um, Harijans, and panchamas, untouchables, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going into all the details because you would have heard of these um, ascriptions already. Later, uh, during the time of uh, Gandhi, uh, one professor from Gujarat, his name uh, is Nasi Mehta. He gave uh, the name Parijan to us. This literally means, uh, later Gandhi also took up that identity for Dalit people, Harijans. But the meaning of Harijan, it looks very good, um, children of God. But the context is very different. When the British uh, wanted to award the communal rights to the, the indigenous people in India, it was at the time of the Devadasi system, which existed, the children who were born out of, you know, the that uh, relationship, they were known uh, as the Harijans, but literally it means children of prostitutes. So we we have outright rejected the identity um, a Harijan. And later, probably uh, we can come back to uh, you know why and what of it. But um, all these ascriptions are not our own ascriptions. These are uh, imposed from outside. It's not our original identity. It is not innate. It is, you know, outside of us. Somebody has given this identity to, to, to all of us, uh, you know, the Dalits in India. Uh, later, even the word Dalit has come from uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar and Jyotiba Phule, um, one of the reformers in uh, Maharashtra. Uh, because Ambedkar didn't want all these identities for Dalit people because it meant the subjugation of a particular community to certain dominant forces in the country. So therefore, Ambedkar and others uh, settled down with this identity of Dalit, which means broken people. 
it was very close to historical truth because we were we were uh, with the scriptures we were broken but literally we are not broken people so therefore the efforts in tumku um for the past 37 years in our journey uh, you know we were really wondering how to really find alternatives to uh, dalit liberation dalit empowerment dalit development and in the process we discovered there are social rhetorics political jargons and economic slogans are plenty all over the country what we discovered in tumkur very uh, specifically is that uh, the culture history and the spirituality of the people was not taken note of that was the starting point for the liberation aspect of dalit people in the uh, district of tumkur Uh, whatever we are going to share with you is not to the entire country of dalits because we know uh, uh, dalit is not one homogeneous group right now we have dalits in christianity dalits in uh, islam dalits in hinduism dalits in buddhism everywhere we are actually scattered But one set of dalit people in tumkur we are uh, constantly trying to see um how the liberative process can be taken further in the future um then where do we really find the alternatives and uh, i mean to be very honest uh, with all of you um we did not find the alternatives in any of the books or in the universities but uh, sitting at the people with the people and uh, sitting at the feet of our people we could discover the liberation philosophy is uh, you know in abundance with the community itself so that is the starting point so the question is what were these people before caste system or dominant forces or religions came into the lives simple answer they were unbroken people that's it so the unbroken people the meaning of adi jan is unbroken uh, people so unbroken people's philosophy and uh, characteristics i think i should just uh, list some of the characteristics of the unbrokenness then you will be able to understand the meaning of adi jan number 1 in inclusive this this particular community dalit community is very inclusive in nature probably this is because we uh, we depend on earth if you look at earth it is earth is all inclusive there is space for all of us so inclusiveness is one characteristic of the community then uh, assertion from mythological time till date we have been asserting ourselves positively so that that is something which is which has to be taken note of fearless community probably we are very much close to the nature so we are fearless we are not scared of uh, you know uh, you know the forests trees animals um in a thing so the fearless community is the adigan community and naturally we are very hospitable and that you would have seen in our villages and we are secure people because we depend on mother earth and we provide unlimited space for all the people on earth and we are resilience resilience is a mark of our uh unbrokenness and uh, non violent people you would i mean uh, the 3500 years of atrocities and uh, the, the 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 oppression the pain all that we have gone through still we have we have not retaliated there is no 
um, attitude of revenge taking. So non, the most non-violent people on earth and peace loving because we don't have the need to establish hegemony and hierarchy, graded inequality uh, on earth. And uh, so we strongly believe that we are um, earth related uh, people and we believe in resilience and that is the mark of the Adijan, um, you know, people, uh, the unbrokenness. And I don't know whether I should continue with uh, a bit of uh, the basis for our uh, spirituality. Uh, probably with that, I can move on to uh, another area. If I can take, um, you know, few, uh, a few minutes to uh, speak to you about the spirituality we follow. There are five centers of spirituality uh, for the Adijan um, you know, people. The, the first uh, is cosmocentrism. We, uh, we believe that uh, we are part of the cosmos. And uh, yeah, when we say this, we understand we are not the center of creation. All dominant religions speak of uh, human beings as center of creation, but we deny and we say, no, we are part of the cosmos. I think this makes us very, very humble. The moment we say that you are center, I think uh, we are in danger. We are you know, trying to establish the dominance. So we want to not only believe, we are convinced and we are, uh, we are practicing in our day-to-day -day life that we are center of the cosmos, uh, sorry, we are part of the cosmos. And of course, in the cosmos, we are different. We are, all of us are different, but uh, the differences need not be um, a foundation for, um, you know, discrimination. Need not be. It need not be a foundation for exploitation. Need not be the foundation for, for uh, graded, uh, you know, in, in inequality that we see in the, uh, you know, in the society today. Uh, for example, man and woman, we are different. A man is different. A woman is different. Their thinking, feelings are different. But that doesn't mean that one is superior, the other one is inferior. We, uh, why not we just accept we are different, but we are equal. So that is the spirit of, um, you know, cosmocentrism. Then the uh, second uh, area is earth-centric. Our sp spirituality is earth-centric. We believe um, that we come from earth and go back to earth. That's all. Our communication stops there. There is no concept of heaven and uh, you know, carrying the legacy uh, into the future. So uh, we look at earth as mother and uh, all motherly uh, uh, quality. When I say mother, it is not that goody goody type of motherly concept, okay? Um, you know, it is something to do with uh, protection, uh, providing, nurturing, caring, etc., etc. All those are values, uh, you know, for us to practice uh, as a spirituality. Um, so, therefore, uh, these qualities are very much presented in the woman or in the women. Therefore, the third center is women centrism. We give uh, we give very important, um, um, you know, place space for women in our tradition. We respect them. All of our ancestors respected them, admired them, and uh, admired them for their specific qualities in life. So that has to be, um, you know, enforced and in our day-to-day -day life, 
the women are respected and given highest uh, um, what position in the family and in the community. So this is third, and the fourth one is um, you know community centrism. We are very much community oriented people, but that doesn't mean individuals do not have place there. Individuals are respected. In individuals are uh, part of the community. Community is part of the individual. That is the concept. The fourth one is an ancestor centrism. We believe not in the gods in the heavens, but uh, we believe. God, I mean, our our elders who lived with us, who wished good things for us, and you know, we draw energy and uh, inspiration from them. Uh, the last one uh, is body, uh, body centrism. Um, yeah, dominant religions, um, caste forces, they have taught us that body is evil. No, body is not evil. I mean, soul is uh, good, body is evil, and the soul will go to heaven. But uh, friends, uh, the Dalit community in Tumkur, we strongly believe we want all that is good for this body in this world, not in the next world. We want good food for our children, good clothing, good shelter, um, good education, good health, everything, you name it. Everything we want uh, for our children in this present world. So I have just uh, touched upon the concept of Abhijan the uh, broken identity, the un unbroken identity, and the uh, spirituality we follow a bit. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was really, you know, thought provoking and illuminating. I'm full of so many questions. But before we, we go to, you know, those specific questions, I was wondering if I can ask you, perhaps both of you, about your personal journey. Right, like how did you adopt this cause and how did you end up in Tumkur doing what you do? Uh, maybe I'll just start and then Pritam can uh, join. Uh, my journey of development started uh, at age of 13. Okay, uh, when I was a uh, high school student, I joined a uh, youth movement in my school and that was the starting point so the the uh, the journey started and it is going on now i'm 67 still there is little more energy left till that energy is uh, there i will continue to journey uh, in whatever uh, way i have shared with you um, so uh, when i was in college again i continued uh, in the same development path. Then later, uh, at the age of, I think, uh, 29 or so, I met Raj. And uh, Raj also had a similar um, you know, thinking process. So we came to Tumkur and we started the journey, uh, but not with uh, you know, Dalit concept, to be very honest with you. We were trained in a Marxian understanding of uh, society. So our analysis were class analysis. So we started organizing all the four, but uh, over a period of time, we understood that uh, India is not only class, but India is uh, based on you know, a caste division of society. Uh, why we uh, discovered this in, in, the, in the Sangam, in the union, in every village, uh, people were very good during the meeting, Sangha meeting, but when they went back, uh, you know, they were, you know, they were, uh, you know, the caste identity became very, pro, you know, prominent in their daily life. So in the, in the union, they were all equals, but when they went out, uh, they were not, uh, you know, equals. They were very, very uh, different. Uh, the Dalit people were not allowed to enter their houses and they were not uh, given water and uh, they were not able to participate in the festivals of the villages. But in the festivals of the villages, all the menial jobs were 
uh, done by the, the Dalit uh, people. Um, maybe later we can talk about Dalit labor and uh, in the context of uh, untouchability. So this was a starting point for Raj and myself. We said, no, we have to invest our time, energy and everything uh, till certain amount of equality has been built with the community of uh, Dalits. It was there we started our journey of organizing the Dalit people in every, every village. But uh, in the process, most of the caste people left us. They said, okay, now Raj and Jyoti are focusing on the uh, Dalit community. So there was an, uh, you know, a sort of exclusion uh, we experienced until then they didn't know who we were, uh, uh, which caste we belonged. But the moment they came to know that Raj and Jyoti are Dalits and they, you know, you know, we personally experienced, you know, that type of an exclusion uh, from the relationship. This happens to, you know, everybody. But on the other side, the Dalit people started uh, gaining um, a lot of self-respect and um, uh, self-confidence. And they started rediscovering their own history and, uh, you know, culture and the spirituality. So they, they did not, uh, you know, have to go outside. Everything was available within the community. So um, it was a very difficult journey for both of us because the bondage, the bondage the Dalit people experienced one internally, the other one is externally. What is that internally is that over a period of say 3,500 years, we have imbibed the ascriptions which was given to us. Over a period of time, we have assumed that identity, thinking that is our own. And later it was fatalism, you know, fatalism uh, because you know, gods wanted us to be like that. So to break that fatalism, we had to really go through a lot of uh, struggle. Uh, the moment we started organizing the, the Dalit people, um, in the in the larger society, um, people started disowning us, meaning a uh, lot of rumors were uh, spread about, um, you know, Rajan Jyoti saying that uh, in the meantime, I was born in a Hindu community and my grandparents converted to um, Christianity. And now we are back into, you know, Abhijan uh, spirituality. So I have gone through three stages of, uh, you know, spirituality. So the, the Hindus start that Rajan Jyoti are converting the Dalit people into Christianity. So there was a huge, uh, what to say, um, you know, uh, they, they spread stories, rumors about uh, both of us and about the organization saying that we are uh, converting people and uh, and we are also um, uh, you know uh, taking people outside uh, india and we are going to send them to different countries and you know converting them you know all the all the stories were uh, you know brought out and it was very very difficult there was a time even uh, there was life threat to both of us and our children were very small and we had to really take them put them here and there etc etc happen but today we are very very happy that uh, the dalit people are able to assert themselves that we are you know we are the origin of uh, you know our community and we have our own history our own culture and our own uh, spirituality based on that, our liberation has to you know, you know, take place. So this is something which, uh, which we are still going on and we are still continuing in the, you know, in, in the district of Tumpur, partly in Karnataka. Yeah, um, I would like to add to what Jyoti has uh, said, but also from my personal experience of 
how uh, you know I ended up here, you know, in Reds and in Tumkur, and um, I was born in the organization that Rajan Jyoti started. You know, being their son, I was there. So for me, growing up itself was uh, in the organization. Growing up around these values and growing around, growing up around. Um, dialogues of, of equality, human rights. So, you know, you keep hearing this as a child, you know, every day over dinner table conversations or you're part of these conferences playing in the side of, you know, you know this, this is how I grew up. So for me personally, um, taking up the Dalit issues when I was, uh, you know, studying my arts and, and taking up these issues to, to be presented in the form of, of art was was something that came to me very naturally. Like I did not, it did not go through a very uh, intellectual process of like, oh, this is what I want to do. It's something that came to me very easily. But the difference was that uh, that that it's exactly what Reds has been doing with the people uh, at the socio-economic and political uh, context. What I wanted to bring in from the cultural perspective as well uh, through arts, arts. I mean, more more than I can't just say cultural perspective, but through the arts. Uh, through performing arts and through uh, visual arts and stuff. And that point was that uh, when we speak about Dalit art, Dalit music, Dalit uh, anything, the, the first thing that we think of is always that um, it's about the difficulties that we have faced, the challenges that we have faced, um, you know, the discriminations, what is, what, you know, how we have been put down for the last 3,500 years. So the, that's the first thought that everybody gets like even when I uh, you know put up my paintings people always expect uh, some sort of a depiction of of uh, people carrying spittoons or people not wearing choppers not being allowed into uh, the temples this type of a depiction is considered to be like in the Dalit context but what we want to consciously do or what we have been consciously doing is that that there is a positive uh, dimension there's a positive perspective to this entire community that is being lost in translation or lost in because we are only highlighting what is being done to us, what is really wrong with us, uh, then um, uh, uh, what is being done to us is really wrong, you know. And but what we are failing to see is that the strength of the community, that's the strength that is in the community, um, if that can be mobilized, if that can be brought together, and people can really, uh, you know. Aware, be aware of the strengths that we have as a community. If that can be, uh, you know, put across to the communities or, or, or of the Adijan across the country, across wherever we're working, if if that is able, I mean, if we are able to do that, that itself would bring some sort of a really uh, lasting change. Is what Reds has always believed in to build on strengths instead of just concentrating on uh, the issues. Yes, the issues are important because they are happening um, in real time, like it is happening now. So we need to address these issues, but to really get out of it, to really like liberate ourselves or like to, to reach that point, what we need to focus on is the positives. So when I took this up and I wanted to like, um, you know, represent the Dalit community through my paintings. And so I started doing, uh, I mean, taking up um, the history of the Dalit community. Uh, which is uh, which is very special because we don't have a written history. So most of our history is through stories and through songs that our elders sing in 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 the villages. So we have to pick up these stories, document them, and and pick up narratives out of that. And then you bring out the positivity that is there, the resilience. Like and and Jyoti listed out a, a set of things that the community is. This, these are the strengths of the community. So how we can bring that out is is how uh, what really got me into it my uh, and that is what influenced my art uh, towards the community and that brought me back into working for in the organization as well so now we're we're taking up very new new uh, innovative projects so dalits are not just doing development work or empowerment you know trainings and and soft skills and things like that anymore we are, we are uh, doing projects with the Dalit community here in Tumkur, which is dealing with carbon credit, carbon emission, you know, environmental, con you know, con to be uh, concerned with the environment, uh, waste management. So, which is really the need of the hour. 
So and uh, and the Dalit community is something that is already in Tumkur specifically. It's something that is um, you know working on these issues already, and it was very easy for us to approach with that because the connection that we have with the earth. Uh, as our mother. So when we talk about not polluting the earth, not not really, um, or creating alternatives that do not destroy the environment, it was really easy, uh, you know, for people to accept this type of change, uh, you know, in in within our area of work. Yeah. So thank you so much. You know, as I listen to you, what is so striking to me is the contrast between the words you're using about identity, about, you know, the, the cultural and religious ideology and thinking and assets and oral histories, so much that you have. The contrast of that between the language of the institutions of modern India, right? You take Article 17 of the Constitution, abolition of untouchability. You take other articles of the Constitution about giving, you know, additional opportunities, you know, for people in the audience. India has some of the most elaborate affirmative action programs, quotas in jobs. But the language of the state, and I can say this as somebody who works on, you know, poverty alleviation programs, is very much about being cast blind and targeting Dalits as though they are poor, landless, lacking education, lacking opportunity, lacking connections to the state, and somehow giving things, right? This idea that the, there's backwardness that can only be cured with cash transfers or, you know, entitlement programs, right? So I'm wondering if I can ask you a little bit, given that how holistic your thinking is and how narrow a definition is employed by the government of India, how do you feel and how do you, you know, how do you react to policies that come into your villages with entitlements, right? And, and so I'd love to hear from you a bit more about that. I think it's a, a very important question um, you have raised uh, it is it is happening uh, from the time we, uh, the, you know, we have our independence and uh, you know the constitution came into force in 1950 and as you have uh, very well said article 17 uh, which speaks of uh, you know untouchability which is uh, which is abolished okay but I think that is the biggest challenge now. Uh, the, the Dalit people are, you know, what to say, uh, raising that issue. If it is abolished, once I was talking in uh, um, in South Africa about uh, untouchability, next day there was a big uh, news in the paper saying that uh, two Indians have come to South Africa and they are spreading stories that untouchability still remains in India. And it is even today, after 20 years, it is still there. Uh, it is, this happened in 2000 year. year. Um, yes, uh, uh, untouchability is abolished. Then why then uh, there is a special affirmative action act, which is called 1989 Atrocity Prevention Act. That itself shows that, um, you know, the caste forces are very much in, in place and untouchability practices are still, uh, still, maybe the forms are changed. The untouchability practices are still in place. For example, we have worked towards a two glass system uh, in India, in, in the village restaurants. Um, I don't know whether you come across, uh, there are two glasses placed and one for the Dalits and the other one for the uh, other caste people. But now with uh, all the assertion and uh, uh, protest, now the glass system in some, uh, certain places they have changed. They have replaced with uh, plastic glass. It is use and throw. But still, you know, under, you know, underneath. Um, you know, the, the, the subtle forms of untouchability is still remains. The question now is, uh, it is not the ignorance of uh, you know the the people. 
I think the system wants this system to prevail because a particular section um, really benefits. It is fortunate for a particular section of the society to have this system in place. And it is unfortunate for the Dalit people because you have to, you know, uh, you have to give in, give in to a certain uh, systems where, for example, the, the labor, the, the free caste labor uh, in the, you know, in the villages, uh, like uh, removing, uh, you know, the dead uh, animals, who are, who are, who's going to do that? Cleaning the drainage, you would have seen even today, there are Dalit people who get into the manhole, uh, you know, the drainage system, we are sending rack you know, rockets to, you know, the space, but we have not, you know, discovered a technology to clean our, you know, our toilets. Probably we have to learn from, uh, you know, other, uh, other countries where even dry latrines are there without water. But in, 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 in India, there are certain places, uh, the light, dry latrines are, you know, you know, it, it is the responsibility of the Dalit people to, 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 to take it up, how come, how come? It is not uh, lack of awareness or ignorance. I think uh, the system helps certain sections of, uh, you know, the, the society to, to, go, to go on. But uh, the, the other aspect of your question, the Dalit people are considered to be the victims. But uh, I think we, there we would like to defer unless and until all of us together, there, there needs to be a, a sort of a collective recognition of the situation. I repeat, a collective recognition, acknowledgement, and acceptance needs to be, uh, you know, to be placed at the national level. Let's sit together. Let's have a campaign. Let's debate about, uh, you know, the Dalit development or uh, liberation or empowerment. Why you and you know me? Why you and others? We are all. If we believe in in the concept of Mother Earth that all of us are equal, all are children of Mother Earth, and it is possible to to remove uh, you know this concept of you and me that we do things for you, or you know you have reservation. And all these questions have to be um, addressed uh, together. If you ask me, I think there is a there is a wound. There is um, a psychologically there is a uh, you know from Dalit perspective there is a wounded psyche. The psyche is wounded, and on the other side, the oppressors also have their psyche. So I think the the, the wounded and the one who you know who's responsible for this wound should come together and have a sort of a negotiation together and talk about the the Dalit uh, strategies for Dalit liberation. And it, it is the time has come that people have to accept that Dalit people are no more uh, victims. They, they are as equal as others. And, and they are, 30 years back, yes, we said we used to cry about our problems and struggles. But today we are offering, offering to the country, offering to the entire world. If at all, the world needs the real peace and the harmony. Please look at the Dalit spirituality, Adijan spirituality, and other indigenous spirituality of the world. And the world will be a better uh, you know, place in terms of establishing peace and uh, you know, harmony. Even, uh, even in the United States, we have indigenous community. We have lived with them. And uh, when they pray, beautiful prayers they have. You know, they say, Grandma Moon. Okay, so your, your moon becomes your grandma and um, in a father's sky, mother earth and all the plants and uh, trees are your sisters. And, uh, um, you know, 
the stars, your ancestors. So there is a relationship between the cosmos and uh, the human beings. Why not we look at these available um, alternatives in the world, especially those who are engaged in human rights, engaged in peacemaking, engaged in bringing uh, harmony one with the nature. I think the time has come for all of us to look at the indigenous community. Not only, I'm not talking about only the Dalit community or Adi, Adijan community. I'm talking about all the uh, indigenous communities of uh, the world. Take for example, the Norway, the Sami people, you know, they have their own uh, specific, uh, you know, parliament. The parliament has been built by the Norway uh, government. So accepting, recognizing, and uh, promoting are the need of the art and similar thing um, has to happen all over the world and especially uh, you know, in India. So now we are in a position to offer to all of us, please look at our spirituality. Probably this is the need of the art. Yeah, um, Jyotiraji, I cannot agree with you more. You know, in my own research, I study the impact of environmental legislation, for example, and environmental cases on pollution levels in India. And there's very little impact. These are not effective approaches taken by the government of India. And one thing I'm hearing in what you're saying is how in India, we have a real opportunity to learn from ourselves, our ancient past, our communities like yours. And it's rather shocking that our legal institutions and the apparatus of the state has not learned from you. They're coming to your community with solutions that you haven't asked for. And they're coming, you know, the, the right to life, Article 21, is very anthropocentric. It's all about man. And it's not even, you know, it's, it's male anthropocentric. It's about man at the center of the universe, right? And how did we ignore our own indigenous, you know, your history is, is, is a powerful history with powerful lessons. So um, gosh, I could talk to you so long about that alone, but we have some questions piling up in our Q&A. And um, one theme of the questions, um, both of you, is about speaking more about this inner strength in the context of crimes and atrocities against the Dalit people, and in particular women, you know, the sexual physical violence against Dalit women, the headlines, the news stories of India are, you know, give us so many examples of, of what happens. So can you talk a little bit about how you deal with it and, you know, your thoughts on what ought to be done. This question comes, a ver variant of this question comes from one of our attendees in South Africa, um, Hussain Vadva. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I wouldn't want to like uh, comment on any specific issue, but I would like to talk about in general because uh, general of Dalit women being, uh, you know, um, atrocities on Dalit women in general that is happening around the country. Um, to be very honest with you, as much as, um, you know, it's not a nice thing to say, it has been this way for a very long time. Uh, from when I remember as being a small kid, working so closely with the Dalit community, we, we have been hearing these um, such stories on a regular basis. And the statistics for that is, I mean, the government has a statistic for that as well. But why we are hearing more and more now is because of the media, which publicizes it, the social media. Now we are able to like, it is getting out. The news is getting out. But this has been the situation for a very long time in, in the Dalit community. The women in the Dalit community have been facing this for quite some time. And there are reasons why. Um, the, what we are taught in general in the society of how we look at women. These are obviously we have discussed all of this as well, but there's also a systematic way of how we have to look at women or how we have to treat women that we are taught. As kids, um, these are 
systems of patriarchy and that has been like completely imbibed into the system of, of, of us in, in, um, in, in the country. But one major question that we have always ask is that when it comes to caste, right, um, they don't want to touch us. They don't want to allow us into the village. They don't want to allow us into the temples. Um, we, we are polluting anything where we go. We are polluting to see. These are all, like Jyoti said, these are the restrictions that is always given to the Dalit community. But none of this comes into play when they want to touch our women or our girls. Then there is no, no caste or no pollution. No, uh, None of this comes into play at that point. So this, it, it really shows that, you know, uh, irrespective of your, your caste your, or or your identity, the, the the discrimination on women is there, but at the same time, discriminating a Dalit woman, it's 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 much easier, I would say, because you can get away with it much easier because the system supports you. Um, your people are sitting in power. So when you are the accused, you go there, it is easier for you to get away from it. And even from the victim side, when you look at these cases, the victim is also somebody who is punished for being a victim. You know, so the system itself, um, even though the, 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 the constitutional law stands with the women, but the caste laws are, are ruling these, uh, you know, uh, these situations. So uh, we personally, in, in, in our area of work, um, the discrimination on women or, or um, even um, um, domestic violence, I think that we have touched upon and I can very proudly say that we have brought it down to a certain extent, but in large, in the Dalit community, in the entire country is something that, uh, that we are all very um, uh, hurt and shocked about. So, but, but um, how much of like involved we, we can be, we are of course in, in speaking up about this, but um, the only solution I can see to this is local Dalit communities coming together um, and, and you know, really getting the awareness of, of what our constitutional rights are. That's the only way that we can stand up for ourselves um, because organizations in one part of India working for another part of India, it's, it's not going to work out that way. The only solution that I see uh, personally very practical solution is that we have to educate ourselves. We have to be aware of what is our rights. Today we are being discriminated. We are because we don't know how to ask questions, and we don't ask questions because we don't know what is right and what is wrong. We are not aware of it. We we only believe what is told to us that this is how you should be. This is the uh, law of the land. This is how the village has been for three thousand years. So you have to follow it. You can't question it, and we don't question it. The minute we start questioning it, we start standing up for ourselves. Yes, there's going to be more violence, you know, when we start standing up for us, ourselves. But that's the only uh, solution that I see, uh, because the constitution is in on on our behalf. Now it is how we implement it, and how much pressure we're going to put in to make sure that the constitution works for what it is meant to be. And the caste laws don't really take over as they have already done in, in, in all the millennia before. So, so one more point I would like to just add. Uh, um, in our work, in our area, we have what is called uh, Dalit Panchayats. In every village, we have uh, Dalit Panchayats. And whatever Pritam has shared, this is how uh, we work with the local um, local community, so they take responsibility for, um, you know, bringing, uh, uh, bringing uh, or replacing the caste constitution with the constitution of India. It's a big work. It's a big work in every village, in every village. So um, we are more conscious about our caste than the constitution. I think it, it is a, it is a very important uh, education which the entire country has to go through. So in every village, this happens. And therefore, we were able to manage to bring down, um, say, 90% uh, of untouchability practice, practices in our villages, say around 500 to 1,000 villages in our area of operation. So you can visibly see 
that these practices are not, uh, you know, um, established. And uh, uh, so the, the, when, when the constitution is asserted, one thing we have to remember, um, the backlash. So people are afraid of the, you know, when you are asserting, the atrocities are more on you. You, you would have come across a lot of situations like that. Therefore, uh, in the recent past, what we have uh, placed before government of India and uh, government of Karnataka is this. In a particular jurisdiction of a police officer, any atrocity and violence and untouchability practices taking place, he or she should be uh, placed responsible for that, uh, you know, action. So, you know, you're bringing the constitution into, you know, practice and uh, making uh, the entire institutionalized uh, uh, mechanism to be responsible for the act of uh, either violence or untouchability practice. So this is something which we are trying to do, but this has to happen in the entire country. Okay, but there we have a problem. We are, as I said earlier, we are not, uh, you know, uh, you know, homogeneous uh, group right now. We are also spread into different, uh, you know, different groups, different religions, and uh, that is something which, uh, you know, like conversion. Um, we we got converted to different religion to escape untouchability, escape indignity. And it is also a form of uh, uh, protest. If you look at uh, Ambedkar, if you look at all our ancestors who converted to other religions, it's a mark of protest uh, of this indignity which is uh, present in the country. Yeah, um, Jyotiraj ji, you know, there's a couple of questions on chat that builds off of this point that you've just made about the, you know, the heterogeneity of of these groups. So um, Sunita Vishwanath has asked, you know, how do you see your work, right? Like your, um, your movement for recognition and your work connecting with other Dalit movements. And if I may ask the most provocative question, how do you see it connecting to politics? I realize it's a big question and we're bumping up against time. So, you know, <laughs> I, I leave it to you. <laughs> yeah, connecting with other, uh, uh, other uh, Dalit networks, there are certain aspects, yes, like question of land. Um, you know, we are able to connect with uh, people who are working on land rights, women's rights. In a very, very central approach, uh, we are able to connect with them. But with the question of culture and spirituality, uh, a big question okay and um, people are uh, you know i think we are the i don't know whether we, i should make the statement we are the we are the only ones we are talking about uh Adijan spirituality we have not heard uh, you know uh, outside and uh, there are others who say please rajan jyoti um they asked uh, they asked us to be what one particular group said uh, please tell your Dalit people to be good Dalits and good untouchables in this birth so that they will be born a better uh, human beings. So how do we really connect with, you know, we are struggling here to, to create an alternative and uh, to be born as a better Dalit. So we have to accept uh, this as our fate. So we have differences of opinion in terms of uh, a cultural context. For example, uh, the Christian Dalits will not accept, the, the Muslim Dalits will not accept the type of uh, uh, spirituality we are uh, you know, proposing. When you say Spir spirituality minus God, you are gone. We are actually taking a big risk. So the right. moment you say, uh, you know, uh, no heavens, no gods, and uh, please look at earth, and you are gone. You are completely excluded, unless and until people are open enough to to look at uh, 
uh, this spirituality on a on a value based whether this could offer um, you know uh, human rights questions and cultural uh, question because for us culture is the way we live is our culture unless uh, you know unless and until uh, we are able to establish you you raise the issue of politics unless and until we raise the issue of a political nationalism in this country you know working together the, that, that is one area where we can we can think of um, you know coming together establishing political nationalism which is nothing but establishing the constitutional uh, you know um, in in rights we also have proposed the present electoral system what we are practicing the first past the post electoral system is not fit for india okay yeah, right 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 so right. to talk about it but it is not because um, this system is meant for two parties the that's right is with two parties. but india cannot i mean india cannot say i mean we cannot uh, say that we have two parties you know we are multi party multi cultural everything is multi in india then how can you have a system which promotes you know certain interests so therefore we are openly proposing and we have started working on it for the past 10 years 12 years a proportionate electoral system would be the suitable um, you know political uh, you know the elect electoral system we have written uh, written about it uh, raj has written a very important book on the electoral system so we hope uh networking with uh, other dalits on on issues like uh, like political nationalism and land and uh, um you know electoral system there are a uh, number of ways we can really relate to each other except uh, you know the adijan uh, you know spirituality i i don't know after the session how many would really agree to you know the sadhijan spirituality uh, as an alternative to uh, to world peace and harmony yeah thank you so much you know i was going to ask you for your last remarks to college students who are in the audience but i think you've already given us that right which is that what i'm hearing from you today is just how important intersections are you know you talked about intersections of caste gender and religion a few minutes ago um before that you talked about the intersections of culture economics and spirituality and now politics i think the big message to our students in our audience is you're in a university never believe one dominant paradigm think hard how do you accommodate pluralism how do you accommodate diversity learn from people who don't write books but have thousands of years of oral history think about how to document don't don't approach groups as less until you talk to them and realize what they stand for and what they believe in right and and those lessons make us all better i would say better as people better as students better as policy makers better as um you know as scholars i would say so i cannot thank you enough for your words today they're enriching they're powerful they're transformative i think um you know i could talk to you for hours i hope we intersect again i hope our students think hard um about all the issues that you've raised because this is the they're the future right our students are a global audience today and they are the future so thank you so much um brahmachari ji buckley center do we have any closing remarks no oh, thank you so much uh we will uh, we will close here and uh for those of you who are asking questions Thank you so much. We will follow up in days with contact information, etc. But look out for an email from the Berkeley Center. Thank you so much to Professor Joshi, and especially a huge thanks to uh, Sri Jyoti Rajji and uh, Sri Pritam Ji. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful night over there in India. Bye bye. Thank you.